Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Can I invite you to please take your seats as we are about to begin? Please move up to, uh, fill, to the front to fill up the seats. Uh, it's free seating except for the reserved seats in the front. I'm Michael Chen from the EDB Society. I'm your MC for this evening. I would like first to share some house guidelines. Please put your mobile phones on silent mode. Uh, during the Q&A session, please use the mics on the two aisles and uh, introduce yourself, your name, your organization before asking your questions. Uh, we will begin shortly. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. A very warm welcome to the EDB Society's Enterprise and Entrepreneur Series. We are very happy to see so many of you here today for the third forum that we are holding under the E-Series. As you know, the E-Series is a six-part initiative undertaken in partnership with the Singapore Management University and with the support of the Economic Development Board. Today, in this third forum, we will explore the mega trend and growth theme of advanced manufacturing and urban solutions pushing frontiers. What's Industry 4.0's impact in the highly urbanized city-state of Singapore and in turn, our positioning to create a smart industry? Let me express our special thanks to UOB, our main sponsor, and the supporting organizations, Nippon Paint, Pasta Mania of the Commonwealth Capital Group, Singapore Business Federation, and Serbana Jurong. May I now invite Mr. Lee Suang Hyang, President of the EDB Society, to give his welcome remarks. Mr. Lee, please. <clears throat> Mr. Chen Kai Fong, Managing Director, EDB. Dr. Tan Chin Nam, distinguished fellow of the EDB Society. We have a lot of friends here. We have a former minister who is also an EDB Society member, Mrs. Yifu Yishun. We have MPs, present and past. We have Leon Pereira, who is also an EDB alumni. And we have um, Arthur Fong, Ahmad Magad, also another EDB alumni. Michael Liu, also a friend of EDB. And Edwin Q also an ex MP. <laughs> and MP. <laughs> Never mind, MP. <laughs> we also have uh, industry captains. We have, uh, I can see Rennie. Rennie is the, uh, was the president eh, of the Singapore Accreditation Council, or chairman, chairman. No, SEC. We have uh, ASME. Could we? We have, um, we have our assistant chief executives of the Enterprise Singapore, the new Enterprise Singapore, Savinda, Mokli, Sauko. We have Speta. Sorry, one more MP. For, I missed out. <laughs> I was only looking at the mail. Miss Cynthia Poa. <laughs> and um, a few other industry associations here. We have Victor Mills, SICC. We have a lot of uh, business people here, and we have a lot of friends from EDB and SMU, and a lot of distinguished guests. Good evening, and welcome to this third forum in the E-Series, the Enterprise and Entrepreneur Series, which, as you've heard, is jointly organized by the EDB Society and the SMU, and supported by the EDB. This series, which was launched by Minister Heng Sui Kiet in January, was initiated to celebrate all our inspiring entrepreneurs and to try and draw lessons from their insights. And at the same time, it's also our response to the Future Economy Report. So at the end of the series, we will compile all your suggestions, your recommendations, your comments, all the salient points, and send them to Minister Hing Sui Kiet as our inputs for the future economy. So 
all your comments today, your inputs will be very valuable, so please contribute. The overarching theme for this series is transforming industries, creating value. And for each of the forums, we have a special, specialized topic. And for today, the topic, as you have heard from Mike, is advanced manufacturing and urban solution, pushing frontiers. This topic is, of course, very close to the hearts of all EDBians, because ever since the EDB was formed, in 1961, to spearhead the industrialization program, manufacturing has been a key pillar in Singapore. It has been a major generator of jobs for Singaporeans. So it is very close to the hearts of all EDBians, and it is a very important topic for us. During my time, manufacturing made up, I think, about 30% of the economy. Over time, as the economy expanded, as the economy diversified, I think manufacturing share has come down a little. And when it came down, I think uh, some economies started to suggest that maybe Singapore should move out of manufacturing and focus on being a service-driven economy. The examples given were London, New York, Tokyo, and maybe Singapore should be a bit like that. I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> I know we in EDB have always felt that manufacturing was important and that uh, London, New York and, and Tokyo can focus on services because the manufacturing can be distributed to other parts of the country, to other cities. Singapore is an island city state, so we are a little bit different. And we've always felt that manufacturing it's important because of the multiplier benefits and the spin-offs. So if we do not have the manufacturing in Singapore, I think many of the supporting services sectors will not be able to be as successful. So I think we are a little bit different. So I was very happy and very happy now to hear that EDB continues to emphasize the importance of manufacturing and that despite the intense competition, EDB has succeeded in continuing to draw in the investments to maintain manufacturing at at least 25% or 20% of the GDP. But I think uh, the face of manufacturing will change. I think with the disruptive technology, with the, all the changes that are taking place in the, in the marketplace, manufacturing will have to change. It will have to transform and renew. And today, we have a very distinguished panel to lead us in the discussion on, on the challenges and on the opportunities that we can take advantage of that are presented by the new developments, advanced manufacturing, the robotics, the uh, industry 4.0, the, uh, the smart factories, urban solutions, and all the exciting new areas we have a, a panel that is, I think, quite diversified. They, are, they come from different sectors. We have Singaporean speakers, we have multinational speakers, different backgrounds, we have technopreneurs, but uh, I was having a chat with them just now, and what struck me was that uh, although they come from different backgrounds, and although we didn't actually specify the attire, they all came in dark suits. <laughs> They're all looking very smart. I'll leave uh, the moderator to introduce the speakers later on, but if I may, I'll just uh, very quickly name them. We have uh, Mr. Peter Ho. He's the founder and chief executive of Hope Technic. We have Mr. Raymond Klein from Siemens. He's the EVP, uh, Digital Factory Process Industries and Drives from Siemens. We have uh, Mr. Amos Leong from uh, UNIVAC. He's the president and CEO. We have uh, Mr. Rio Yamara. Yam Yamara. He's a VP from Fujitsu. New Solution Business Division of Fujitsu Asia and co-director of Fujitsu SMU Urban Computing and Engineering Corporate Lab. 
And finally, we have our very own EDBN, Mr. Wong Heng Fine. It's the other side. Sorry. Wong Heng Fine. <coughs> Group CEO of Sabana Jurong. And to orchestrate the, uh, and manage these smart speakers, we have a very smart moderator. We are very privileged to have, uh, <coughs> once again, as moderator, uh, the president of SMU, Professor Arnau de Mayer. I think I have pronounced it correct this time. <laughs> Who himself has written extensively on manufacturing and on the <coughs> technology strategies. So, very well qualified moderator. He could have been a speaker too. But I think we need him to control the, the speakers. This series, as you have heard from Mike, would not have been possible without the generous support of our sponsors and supporters. And uh, before I end, if you allow me, I'd like to thank them once again, our main sponsors, UOB, our supporting organizations, Nippon Paint, Singapore Federa Business Federation, Sabana Jurong, and Pastor Mania. I would also like to thank uh, the, our partners, EDB and SMU. Thank you, uh, Kai Fong. And thank you, Anna. And of course, I must not forget to thank our organizing committee, our very hardworking 24 7 organizing committee <laughs> that never sleeps. A committee ably led by the energetic and in the how shall I call it, uh, untiring, maybe un energetic and untiring uh, Honorary Secretary Daisy Go. So thank you, Tim. <laughs> and finally, thank you everyone for coming. Thank you very much for your support. We've had uh, very good support throughout this series. Full house in the first two uh, forums. Today, we don't know, maybe because of the rain, not quite full house yet, but I live in hope they may still be coming in. Anyway, enjoy the evening, have a productive evening, and over to you, Anal. Without further ado, uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Miss Lee. Without further ado, uh, we now proceed to the panel discussion. Uh, may I ask for the five distinguished panelists to come up? Uh, Mr. Peter Ho, Mr. Raimond uh, Klein, uh, Mr. Amos Leong, uh, Mr. Wong Hing Fine, and Mr. Roichi uh, Yamara. Uh, of course, uh, Professor Arnold de Mayer. Good evening to all of you, and uh, also from my side, a very warm welcome to SMU. I can say that as president, uh, and that will be the last word that I say as president of SMU here. Uh, I, the rest of the uh, proceedings. proceedings today, uh, I'm more the passionate researcher about uh, manufacturing management, advanced manufacturing, and urban solutions. Uh, but I do want to say also welcome, because you mentioned the EDB society members, the fellows. I also see a few parents of SMU students here in the room, so uh, they're also very welcome here tonight. Uh, and if you think that it's very quiet on the university today, on the university grounds, it's because it's exam week. Uh, <laughs> that's the time that it is very quiet. Now, I'm passionate about this topic of advanced manufacturing and urban solutions because I believe that, like you said, uh, Mr. Lee, that um, the, uh, the, 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 um, the manufacturing is actually a driving force of economic success here in Singapore. About two years ago, I wrote an article in Straits Times where I said manufacturing is at this stage about 20% of the GDP and it shouldn't go below that. It probably is going to go below a lot lower in terms of percentage of employment in Singapore. It's only already only 13 or 14% of employment, but it is a generator of value added, value added that also requires a lot of activities um, from other sectors here in um, Singapore, and that contributes enormously to the international trade. But of course, given our very special situation here um, in Singapore, uh, we, um, we, we know that we need to have a special type of manufacturing. We have uh, a high level 
of, uh, or we have high labor costs, I should say, say, so we cannot go for the cheap mass market manufacturing that you may find in low labor cost countries. Secondly, we have limited uh, amount of land. We, have, uh, we live in a city and thus we need to have also manufacturing that is adjusted uh, to, that, to those conditions of uh, a dense population and limited uh, uh, land here, in limited area on which we can build. Thus, and that's the link that actually is in this title, uh, Advanced Manufacturing and Urban Solutions, we need to find a solution for manufacturing in an urban environment, and the urban environment needs to also be co-developed, adjusted, it needs to evolve in order to make sure that we can keep that 20% of GDP generated by um, manufacturing. And that's the reason why we have a rather diverse panel, and I will not go into their CVs, you have them in the little brochure that was handed out before, and I always uh, tell at the introduction of a panel like this, uh, the experience I had once when I had to introduce the CEO of uh, Oracle, Mr. Larry Ellison. And I had asked his secretariat to give me his CV, and he wrote, they wrote back, Mr. Larry Ellison is the CEO of Oracle. Uh, I found that a bit short, so I wrote back an email and say, can I have a bit longer CV because I have, need to introduce you? And he wrote back and he says, the longer the CV, the less important you are. Because we have very important people here on the, uh, on the panel, I will keep uh, the introduction very short. But we have manufacturers, we have people who are um, uh, specialists in urban solutions, we have people that are creating infrastructure in which this, infra uh, in which this urban solutions need to be embedded and in which the manufacturing needs to be embedded. So what I wanted to do with them is give them the opportunity to give a few uh, their views on the title of this topic, uh, Advanced Manufacturing and Urban Solutions, Pushing the Frontiers. I will start with some of the manufacturers and then later on move to the, the people who provide the environment in which this manufacturing operates. Um, after the introductions and maybe some discussion among the panel, I will then hand over to the room and I hope that you will have all kinds of interesting Obviously, they're going to be interesting, but that you have many questions uh, about the topic. Raymond, I would like to start with you and ask you, given this title of advanced manufacturing and uh, urban solutions in Singapore and in Southeast Asia, what are the issues that you want to bring up in terms of pushing the frontiers? A short introduction. My name is Raymond, as he said, very short. Um, since four years, I have the task uh, to develop a digital ecosystem. This is called zero one dot design, but it's only one O in the zero and design with a capital E. This is zero one, the binary code. And uh, we're designing here since four years an ecosystem where we reinvent our classic portfolio and the software portfolio we acquired over the last eight years, our market approach. The zero one dot design digitalization toolbox actually, and then I'm coming to Singapore and the, the topics we have, consist of new consultative sales, not anymore the product, the system sales, consultative sales, so-called digitalization core modules, data design. Everybody talks about big data analytics, but the biggest problem is first of all, what is your problem and what data design we need to take to upload your problem into a cloud. This is the next one, cloud technology. The other one, of course, cybersecurity, the enterprise of cybersecurity, then remote analytic hub. And when you take these core modules, there are 20 at the moment of them, and you assemble them in different variations, you come to vertical solutions. Harbor digitalization, pulp and paper solutions, metal, semiconductor, and this is the third, let's say, column. And last but not least, the last one, and here I must tell you I'm a little bit old, I'm 56, we are a little bit afraid of ourselves, is disruptive business models. We have several of them, one is a Uber app for industrial services, but when you see how you need to scale up such disruptive business models and you are used 
as Siemens to have business target agreements, follow the investment, get the profit done, then these, let's say, disruptive business model to push them are quite a personal risk, I need to say. Now, I'm responsible for ASEAN. Uh, we built this digitalization hub up here in Singapore uh, because, not because I'm now sitting here in front of you all, because Singapore is quite advanced in digitalization. If you go to, by example, Indonesia pushed the button two weeks ago to start to digitalization for Indonesia, Industry 4.0. Um, very aggressive Vietnamese, I must say. Uh, but also here a background because we built Adidas, so-called speed factories. If you go to YouTube, you will see that those factories are built where the demand is. It's 500 million pairs of shoes, each factory 5 million, highly automated, and at the moment 70,000 people working in Vietnam in these Adidas factories. And the new speed factories, 100 of them, round about 200 people in those so-called speed factory. Lot size, you do your personal design, delivered in five days out of the factory. Time to market reduced from 15 months to seven months. This is number one. Number two, Winfast, the automotive factory in Vietnam. They built now in 24 months a complete new plant with, let's say, horizontal vertical integration of the value chain, and this is actually the industry 4.0 approach, how we uh, develop it. So it's not robotics. We're going to the R&D, we're going to the manufacturing design, to the manufacturing engineering, to the operation, and to so-called later digital services for the product itself. And we integrate the value chain with software. And here's the newest uh, development. So we, as I mentioned, we developed this ecosystem here in Singapore. So at the moment, we start then developing a software system house for vertical horizontal integration of the software for manufacturing, uh, as well as 3D printing as a service, and, and, and. So what you can see, we're learning by doing. Nike said, just do it, Nike. And so we just do it. And by doing it, we learn that we have gaps in the portfolio of digitalization, and then we create new modules filling these gaps. Singapore, from an educational point of view, these factories in the future will be built where you have the educational background. So the investment where you do these fully automated digital factories is everywhere the same. But you need the people to drive these factories and also digitalization of supply chain. And these people you're not finding at the moment everywhere in ASEAN, I must say. Uh, but nevertheless, the challenge, we also not finding them every time here in Singapore. So what we do is we normally write a first job profile, hire the first batch of young people. Then after observing how they develop, we writing the second batch job profiles, what we didn't get in the first batch, and then we mix the teams to upgrade the people itself. Urban, pushing frontiers, borders. What we see from a development is that in the future you might not so much differentiate anymore between the industry sector, the logistics supply chain, because it need to be fully integrated in the manufacturing side, and also then, let's say, dispatch centers like the harbor here, PSA, which also th thinks how to reinvent, reinvent themselves from a logistic operations. This is a little bit the background to my person. Thank you very much. Um, Amos, um, you in Univac uh, offer integrated solutions for design up to uh, logistics uh, for the different indus for dif industries such as medical, uh, uh, life sciences, medical and FMCG industries. How do you look at pushing the frontiers in this particular industry? Well, actually, the reality is, uh, although we serve such industries, you know, it's really true, a lot of uh, brute force, in my opinion. When I entered the manufacturing industry about 30 years ago, I think business was easy for manufacturers in Asia, right? You know, the wave of outsourcing from Europe, US coming over here, 
the supporting industries are thriving because of all the disk drive manufacturing, semiconductors, computers, peripherals, right? And, and the growth continued 10 years after 10 years because it always was chasing after cheaper labor, cheaper, in, cheaper cost structures. So sure enough, you see many companies in Singapore driving from Singapore to Malaysia, then Malaysia to China. And, and, and interestingly, this growth phenomena came to a stop about 10 to 15 years ago, right? Because I think the era of cheap labor is coming to an end. And, and many of us in the manufacturing sector, if you are in the supporting industries, Univac being one of them, a, a lot of us refuse to believe it. So we keep trying to go cheaper and cheaper, you know? So it's very brute force oriented, you know? And it's pretty much just chasing for cheaper and cheaper uh, geographies, right? And even today, you can hear many people in China, you know, in the Jiangsu area, you go further inland, right? You know, you see the town is doing the same thing. They go to Chengdu, Chongqing. Now, Wuhan is the next place, right? So I think that there were a number of us whereby we, we start to rethink, you know. Is this the way we want to differentiate ourselves, you see? So some of us, we took the reverse, right? We, we choose not to go after cheap manufacturing anymore. We go and rethink again. Is there a business whereby we go in and solve difficult manufacturing problems, right? So when you want to go into solving difficult manufacturing problems, that's where advanced manufacturing comes in, right? If some of you have the opportunity to go to places like Germany, Switzerland, you know, I think those are good examples. They are not solving manufacturing problems very easily. They look into a design right at the front and they already decided what is a manufacturing strategy. So they are already looking into more of an integrated approach end to end. You see? So I really believe uh, after spending 30 years, especially in the recent last 10 years, you know, it was a wake up call. When we realized there's no way to keep finding a cheaper place to do manufacturing, we had to really do the reverse trend. And for companies that seriously wanted to reinvent ourselves, you know, we, we start to see a reverse trend. The more you go into advanced manufacturing, the more you enjoy the fruits of labor, right? But it is very, very difficult because a lot of manufacturing, especially in the supporting industries, you know, if you look into a 20-man, 50-man, maybe a 200-man company in Singapore, right? Wow, how do they reinvent themselves? How do they start? Some of them are already struggling in terms of meet, meeting their profit numbers. And of course, Mr. Ryman here, they go in with the great solutions, right? You know? but how many of them can afford those horizontal vertical solutions? So it was a reality check. It was really a reality check. And even for companies that bought those solutions, they are struggling to figure out what, in the, what, what is digital transformation? You know, what, what is this all about? Automation is a bit more straightforward. Even I challenge people who start employing robots, what, what are you benefiting to a certain extent? Perhaps later on, Peter could share some of his experience, right? You know, he, he's into selling robotic solutions, you know. So I, I would say my, my perspective of advanced manufacturing is not so much about digital transformation and automation. I think the mindset has to change first. In other words, the business strategy has to lead first. So, so I, I'm one of those strong proposers, right? Manufacturing must stay in Singapore. If you do have manufacturing, forget about R&D, forget about engineering. Because if you don't have the credentials to know what is the problem is manufacturing, what makes you think you can go up there and say, I can design a product great for manufacturing? So I think that was pretty much where our early beginnings, we start going upstream, you know, because of our manufacturing, we go and captivate the Europeans and Americans. Hey, maybe we can solve your problems a bit earlier in design. Give us a chance to participate in your engineering, in your design. So in our roadmap, especially in the last 10 years, we grow significantly going upstream to protect manufacturing, right? So if you can get into this design space, you get to influence how you want to manufacture it. And perhaps you have a chance to drive a, a more affordable value chain, right? So if you want to automate, you don't automate by taking a product and do that. You do that in design, you see. You know? And of course, for people whereby they may not have a chance to participate in the upstream design, you go downstream. You go into applications and you find ways to be more innovative, 
to touch the end markets. You know. So I think the, the end-to-end or the integrated manufacturing approach perhaps could be different for different industries. Right? So I, I really urge uh, us to consider how do we want to reinvent the manufacturing landscape. It, it requires a bit more of a business strategy first, not so much adopting solutions. You know. I think there's a space for that. You know, and, and you have to be ready. The mindset of the management, the readiness of the people. And, and I chatted with uh, Raymond a bit. You know, when, when we look into a typical supporting industry manufacturing company, maybe 50 to 150 people, some of them don't even have an IT backbone. How are they even going to understand what is digitizing, bringing IT into the manufacturing space, and being ready to engage the digitally network chains that is pushing very hard by a lot of big companies out there. So I, for my company, we enjoy some good business. I think right now in the process of transforming from good old manufacturing to advanced manufacturing, it is a painful process. Uh, certainly, when time permits, I'd like to perhaps share some of our experience. Uh, before I move on, um, Amos, uh, you sort of were indicating that uh, you go more upstream in the business, um, but do you find the people in Singapore that can help you in doing that? I mean, Raymond was also referring to the fact that investments you can make everywhere, but it's the people, the well-educated people that you need. Um. Well, I mean, for, for the people who are in, in training the, the next generation of people, right? You know, Perhaps... Are you talking about me? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I see, I see. I, I, I think Singapore, because we started as a trading port, uh, I mean, uh, uh, pardon my blunt word, I mean, we still have a bit more trading mentality, you know. We, we, we tend not to go deep, you see, you know. And when you want to do engineering and design work, you need that, you see. You need to know the math, the science, you know. You cannot just be a project manager hope to find cheaper talents from lower, I mean, sort of uh, countries like China and India, right? But right now, they are more advanced. Why should they come to Singapore, right? So I think fundamentally, back here in Singapore, we must continue to build that, you know, in knowledge and know-how. Whether is it in materials, is it in engineering in process, it's time to get the young people more interested in building that. And manufacturing, you need that if you want to go upstream into design, you know, engineering. Because if not, you are just doing by try and error. You ask many engineers, design or experiment, they don't even know where to start, you see. But some of us in our earlier years, you know, we, we study more, more depth, you know. I think there is a lot of need to go back into this area. So we cannot keep training generalists anymore. I think it's time to get the polytechnics, the universities, to seriously get our engineers, at least those talents I wanted, to really go into depth, you know. And, and to be honest, uh, in the near term, in the last five, ten years, we, we tap into talents from Europe and US. You pay more, but you get the people who can solve the problem for you. I should mention I'm an electrical engineer. Maybe I have a career. <laughs> <laughs> um, Yang Fine, you are... Uh, with uh, Surbana Jurong uh, actually providing infrastructure for manufacturing and also infrastructure for the, for the city. How do you look at this title of uh, pushing the frontiers in Singapore? Well, I think the next uh, 10, 15 years, uh, you will see new generation of cities that is going to come up. Uh, and, uh, and that's because uh, you know, today you can see a lot of uh, new developments a uh, driverless car, for example, is going to change a lot of the way we think about how city uh, operates. Uh, you know, the uh, e-commerce, yeah, some of the uh, older shopping centers are finding it extremely difficult to find, uh, you know, retailers. Yeah. So we see a situation where uh, going forward, uh, a lot of our cities, especially established cities, will find it very hard to change over. Yeah. Uh, and uh, again, uh, some of the newer cities in China will probably uh, uh, far probably exceed some of the, the older cities. Yeah. Uh, some of you know that uh, Beijing is building a sister city called Xiong'an. Yeah. Uh, and uh, they, they are going to implement a lot of uh, new things. One of the newer things there 
is that the, the apartments and the residential will not be for sale. It's only for rental. Yeah. So the, the share economy is going to uh, also take a major uh, toll uh, on some of the things that we do. Here in Singapore, I think we are a little bit, dis uh, a little bit uh, advantaged in the sense that we, we, our city planning and the way in which we look at infrastructure support for a lot of our manufacturers and a lot of our uh, uh, consumers as well as uh, peop uh, our residents uh, have been on a very intense and very urbanized uh, uh, way. Uh, so today, a lot of the major western cities in Melbourne and Sydney, for example, they're all moving back to the city because they find that you know, the travel time uh, you know, to, to, uh, from and to work uh, takes a lot of, of the inefficiencies. Yeah? So, for example, in Melbourne, typically a person would tra need to travel about at least an hour uh, to get to work and uh, an hour to get back. So you have two hours of inefficiency. Yeah? So today, uh, in, in, in Melbourne, Sydney, we are seeing a lot of what we call transit-oriented development. Uh, development where it's mixed use. Yeah. Uh, so city planning and some of our regulations will also need to change. Yeah. Uh, you know, we are so rigid in Singapore, for example, on our land use. Yeah. Uh, we have always been engaging uh, URA to say that we cannot be so rigid. Uh, so today, you'll find in a lot of the, the, the restaurants, for example, they only operate based on certain number of hours. Yeah. We are now designing spaces, uh, retail spaces that operate 24 hours yeah, by different operators over that period. So the question is, how do you do that? Yeah, so you've got to look at your infrastructure, your, all your M&E services, uh, if it's for, for F&B, it will be quite different. Uh, or if uh, you, know, you need storage space. Yeah. So in future, you'll find that a lot of the, maybe the food may not be cooked uh, you know, on site, maybe cook elsewhere in the central kitchen, and then you know, bring in into those uh, uh, F&B places. So, a lot of the changes are going to happen. Uh, one of the major changes will happen is car parking. Yeah. We feel that uh, in future uh, there will be no requirements for, for car park, yeah. uh, and uh, you know, we think uh, in a matter of five to seven years, driverless car will be a norm. Uh, so the way in which we look at mobility and you know the connect connectivity and so on are quite different. Uh, we've just finished a, in, a new industrial park concept uh, for JTC that links directly uh, underground, uh, uh, you know, a uh, transport system of goods and services uh, directly to the port. Mm -hmm. And then and some of this, we are doing also another uh, city uh, in the eastern economic corridor of Thailand. Uh, where we will integrate uh, farming uh, into that uh, city planning. So we have different levels of the city uh, and we maintain that uh, uh, all the ecosystem, you know, uh, you know in terms of uh, water, in terms of uh, accessibility, in terms of farming and so on. So we are very also very big into urban farming because we believe in future uh, the way in which we supply uh, all the raw materials, uh, you know, the food, to the residents uh, will change. Uh, so today we are growing or rearing uh, groupers in high-rise uh, six-story building. Yeah. Uh, and we intend to put that uh, underneath some of the flyovers uh, that you see across the world. Yeah. Uh, vertical uh, 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 vegetable farming is going to come, in, come into place. Yeah. So, so, so a lot of uh, the way in which we look at city and city life and some of our daily essentials were, go were going to be quite different. But in the past, we used to um, uh, isolate usually manufacturing in industrial zones. Do you think that they will be also more integrated with the cities? Uh, that we will have factories there where people live and, be in and entertain themselves and, and eat and whatever, live and yeah, enjoy themselves? Yeah. Uh, well, I think one of the things um, we have done very well in Singapore is the concept of building uh, vertical factories. Yeah. Uh, and we are actually selling this concept uh, overseas. Yeah. Uh, we just finished a poultry factory that uh, is seven story. We take in live chicken slaughterhouse at the bottom and then process at, uh, at every level. Uh, and the top comes some uh, man nuggets. 
Uh, and in that process, we, we make sure that you know, all the different levels are occupied by different manufacturers, uh, but they use uh, say, you know, the uh, common uh, services. So Singapore has actually gone quite far ahead in trying to bring uh, manufacturing or processing plant uh, into the city. And that's not the case in a lot of the, yeah. the, the cities that we see. So uh, again, the things that we have done here over the next uh, 10, 15 years is going to be quite relevant for new cities that's going to come up. Do you think that that concept can export it uh, to other countries? Definitely. This, yeah. In fact, we are doing that. Yeah. Uh, uh, Rio, you are dreaming up new urban solutions uh, for the world and for uh, Japan in, in, in Fujitsu. Uh, which frontiers are you pushing? Um, thank you very much. Uh, just a little bit about myself and my company uh, doing here in um, Singapore. Um, Fujitsu, um, back in 2015, started a um, research lab with uh, SMU and also ASTAR, the Government Institute. Um, who, who of you today from SMU? Not that much, thank you. Um, anybody from ASTAR? Okay, then I, I can talk about uh, reality. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, apart from that joke, then um, what we are addressing here is urban solutions. Um, looking at um, the areas of mobility, first to come, and also uh, maritime uh, operation, talking about safety and security and um, productivity, and also urban logistics. Then uh, throughout those um, activities, what I feel uh, is uh, like this. Singapore is a really, really unique place. Singapore is a really unique place. Um, all those kind of urban challenges, if uh, we do the things in the different places like China, the US, um, maybe the way would be different. Like you said, um, Beijing now trying to um, build up a sister city around. And maybe US, they have enough land and so. But uh, this country um, has limited land space and limited resource. So in that circumstances, uh, what is, is what important is uh, optimization in the end. So our laboratory is um, talking about our slogan, sailing, adding capacity without building capacity. Again, adding capacity without building capacity. This is a bit contradictional way to describe the thing, but it is Singapore. Um, you cannot build up uh, new buildings um, or new lands and all that. Then when it comes to the problem and challenges of optimization, what is required? It is ICT. Right? Um, all those are computational simulation and modeling and optimization and goes over um, AI, uh, deep learning and autonomous uh, designing and programming and everything. So um, having said that, um, again, uh, Singapore has a strength uh, to uh, be um, to be this um, challenging country of the um, city country, uh, where we can test a lot of new um, technologies and solutions. So looking at the countries around, um, many economists are telling that um, the economical growth in the future is not based on countries, but uh, the boundary uh, changes quite a lot in the near future. Uh, all the economical growth will be city-based. We are not talking about Thailand, we are not talking about Indonesia, but uh, the economic uh, sector is really Jakarta, uh, Ho Chi Minh City, and uh, Bangkok. So, um, a bit in the contrary to the thing I mentioned, um, although other countries have larger spaces, but uh, Singapore is the only one place where we can test the urbanization challenges where other countries are facing soon. So uh, I'm quite uh, excited to have this project working with SMU and ASTER, uh, try out all those uh, new technologies and solutions and uh, commercialize it in the future in other countries around. Um, since you are a specialist on mobility, I just heard uh, Hien Fein saying that uh, 
in seven years from now, we won't need car parks anymore. I'm already thinking what I can do with the car park of SMU, but, um, <laughs> but do you believe that? Are you uh, convinced of that, that is the, the direction we go? Uh, yes, but I'm not sure. Hello? I'm not sure how soon it, it will come. Um, I'm not the only one who worry about... Uh, Hello? Just, just lean a bit forward. I know there is... An, uh, All right. Yeah. Uh, maybe I'm not the only one. Uh, we have a lot of uh, ethical challenges. So you can read a lot of newspapers. Um, what if autonomous vehicle kill, kills a human being, right? So although um, a lot, there are a lot of uh, traffic accidents and many people are killed by human, but if the robot kills a human, that's going to be a big problem. <laughs> yeah, but this is a contradiction. All the AI and the technology scholars are now discussing. So anyway, the future will come. No question about it. But before that, we have to uh, find a way uh, to rightly handle those kind of ethical challenges. Then, having said so, Again, I think Singapore is um, um, a very good place to uh, try, try out that, uh, new challenges. Um, what, is, what is unique in Singapore? Um, I don't even have to say the answer. It is the diversity, right? So in this country, there are many different ways of thinking and culture and the value and all that. So. Uh, one of the A-star uh, researcher who is now doing AI uh, research um, is talking about the future robot really have to understand human emotion and um, the machine has, has, has to be very um, empathy explainable one. So it's not just talking about behavior and algorithm of the thing, but uh, machine has to understand human emotion then how many human emotions existing in this world? Um, it depends on culture and dif dif difference of the history and all that. So if the same ha thing happens to you, maybe Chinese would think different way, Japanese would think different way, Singaporean, Filipinos and all that. So I think this researcher is really looking to the right direction. Singapore is the only place where you can really learn and test all those different diversity of people's emotion and uh, behavior. Um, Peter, you are the last one in this, uh, uh, in this series. Uh, you providing the robotics for all this manufacturing, uh, the robotic solutions, our friends, the robots of Lovots, right? Uh, I love my robot, uh, <laughs> the Lovots. Uh, what your, what's your thinking about these uh, pushing the frontiers? Um, evening, uh, my name is Peter. Um, there's one part of the business under Hope Technique called Sesto Robotics, where we build robots, um, AGVs with arms or autonomous forklifts. Um, let's be very blunt and candid here. When you start talking about Industry 4.0 and job displacement and all, that's the business that we do. We have operationalized semiconductor factories to be dark factories already. Um, it's not about a robot which runs around on its own. It's about that we sold two years ago. Lots of competition. Now we sell robots which drive around with a robotic arm on board. It scans the scenario, it picks up the food from the semiconductor um, fab, and it takes it to the next one and plugs it in. We've done the same for pallets in warehouses, we've done it indoors and outdoors, Singapore, around the world. Many years ago, I said something to my team and they said, hey, when we start selling all these advanced robotics around the world, don't we get scared of IP? I told them, don't worry. Any country that wants to copy IP, they won't be buying this, they've got manpower, right? Um, that's my favorite statement that's still remembered in the office. Obviously, I'm not going to tell you the country, but you can all guess. Let's be polite. Um, the reality of the matter is that that's the biggest customer that we sell to as a country. Now, what is advanced robotics? Um, wrong, advanced manufacturing. I think we completely make it very simple. Our, personal, our point of view from where we see it is that it is doing anything, anywhere. That means all this 3D printing, robots and stuff like that. We are seeing it. We are seeing very, very sophisticated manufacturing processes that we are enabling that are devoid of any humans. We have taken from one level of a semiconductor wafer plant, okay, we have made 80 persons displaced using six robots. And it's worth them. Now, what's my point? Gloom and gloom. Anything, anywhere is a very frightening choice. That means we could literally take the entire system there 
and take it out from one country and toss it to another country at a lower cost, which I think the other panelists have mentioned this evening. I hear the same um, resounding thing, which is really bad being the last speaker. They just take all your points. Um, <laughs> when it comes to the intellectual capital of the people that operate there, I think, yes, we have to respect that. But at the same time, I have to be worried. I just came back from Yangon um, two weeks ago, and everybody's glued to a smartphone. Yes, they're watching America's Next Top Model or something like that. Very soon, they'll be watching or uh, reading stuff on Coursera and they'll be learning stuff because they are, they are now exposed, communications there. So when you start looking at human capital, my worry is that it's not long. Um, I'm a founder of Hope Technique, one of the four co-founders, sorry, to be exact. Um, and the other business we build is Red Rhino fire trucks and stuff like that, but that's not the point. My point is that as founders, we are engineers. And I can't read a P&L statement until my board required me to actually explain it. And so I went to Coursera and I learned an online course. Right now, I am semi-decent in answering a balance sheet and understanding the impacts to it. Now, that same education is free. That's a cheap quote for Coursera I can get for free. Um, and so what happens is that you can learn the stuff, and this happens everywhere else in the world. Now, back to the local context, besides the doom and gloom, um, I think this anywhere thing about um, why people would choose to do advanced manufacturing in Singapore in the future is something we should not think, um, take too lightly. I think advanced manufacturing is something that can be achieved in any country in the world. When Rolls-Royce announced that its first 3D printed jet engine was running, now you don't need to be in Kent to build that in the UK anymore. You take that same machine, you go to a corner of, that's exaggerated for fun, Iceland. You could theoretically, if the machine is running at right temperature, build it if you had the electricity that was stable enough. Now you don't need the people anymore. Now it's all doom and gloom. Um, so if we say that this is a penicillin and let's embrace robotics and stuff like that, I can I, 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 my personal point of view is that we're just following the herd. Everyone is going in the same direction. There's no reason why we are going to be ahead of anybody else. Everything else that costs money, we are more expensive. So I feel, okay, it's not still more doom and gloom, huh? Um, the truth of the matter is we have to have enough guts to make a double jump which is, when I said it's defined as anything, anywhere, I think the question of anywhere, let's ignore that we are even in the, in the equation in the long term. I think anything is the question that we need to ask. What do we do? And I think this is a, is a question of not complicated anymore, it's a question of complex. So all this advanced manufacturing stuff is very good at doing the complicated stuff. We can do 58 layer PCBs on the blah blah, don't know how many nanometers, ka la 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 la. We can do artificial valves for the heart, all automated, the kind of stuff. That is complicated. I think the business that we have an opportunity in this country to do is to continue to focus on complex stuff. That means it's not just about the manufacturing itself, it's about all the rest of the ecosystems that come along with it. Things which which complex cannot be bought or replicated that easy. So you need to add in a lot, which is where it comes to human capital. But it's not just, I'm an engineer, I'm proud of it. It's not just about the engineers per se, it's the rest of the entire system. It's about a, a political system, I mean a country which is stable, okay, let's not have a mutiny. Uh, let's make sure our electricity is, is, is there. I'm very sure Sabana Jurong is gonna make really good buildings and, 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 and estates per se. And then after that comes the rest of it, the way we do trade and stuff like that, the way we protect IP. At the end of the day, um, I believe in the next 10 years, you can make, if we can make anything in this country by advanced manufacturing, any other country in the world with the same machines could do the same. And that we should not lie to ourselves. And so I believe we should just come, we should make the double jump. And on my last point, the painful part that I was smacked by uh, some, one of my mentors is Strategy takes sacrifice. That means a lot of the businesses that we do currently that built this great country up is not going to be relevant tomorrow. And that's not something that people like to think about. The truth of the matter is if we think that robots are going to do the, a lot of production work that we do, we know it's not going to happen. It's a slow and painful death. So I've said too much, I'm gonna get myself in trouble. Um, you raised the question that uh a production can be, or manufacturing can be done any t anytime, anywhere, and that necessarily we don't have an, a natural advantage here in Singapore. What should we do to keep, an, or to, to build a natural advantage, to build, build a competitive advantage in advanced manufacturing? 
I think there are two sides to it. One of them is an operator, one is an owner. I think when it comes to the operator side, the question whether we adopt advanced manufacturing, oh, this doom and gloom is not that immediate, it's, it's years to come. So the answer is, are we going to do advanced manufacturing? I think the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. um, I think we, we are all on the same page that if we don't adopt it and go and run with it as fast as the best guys in the world, we would be dead. So that's one side. That is just holding on to what we have. I think the other flip side is the ownership becomes interesting. Now in advanced manufacturing, there's a way to do scalability that we have never seen before. It is almost the same as a software model, but it's very IP driven. So let's just take an example of a 3D printer. I hope I don't sound on anyone's toes when I say this. It is not about buying 10 or 20 million dollars of 3D printers and saying that we have a 3D, we, we are world leaders. It's not about that. It is about creating the next technology or the next raisin or the next uh, machine or the next process and owning the IP and having a business that actually does and takes it globally. That, I feel, that will be the new economy of what we will do. And that's how advanced manufacturing in Singapore, if we are not going to fight it, look, if we can 3D print, um, if Rolls-Royce can 3D print a jet engine, wouldn't it be nice if that machine that builds the qualified FAA ESA approved jet engine was printed using a machine, now I'm being very nationalistic here, that was designed and manufactured in this country and was a tax citizen, a corporate tax citizen of this country. Now that would be our future. So yeah, wonderful, go fly all your planes around the world, Airbus, Boeing, you can go and buy Bombardier, you can go and buy the planes, you'll be our engine. And that's how I feel we will survive. Raymond. You like controversial discussion yes. you said at the beginning, so <laughs> actually, actually, I cannot, to make it diplomatic, I'm not very diplomatic, that's the no. reason I'm not in politics. I cannot fully agree with your statements. Let's start with the 3D printing. First of all, every 3D printer has another mathematic model. The biggest problem at the moment of 3D printing is to create a system of design with a closed loop how to print, with measuring the quality of the design, how you print it, and then do the rework. There's nobody in the world who can deliver that at the moment. Number two, you can build in Iceland Bitcoin because of the temperature, I assume, was the example. You can do this 3D printing, but if the ecosystem does not exist, who is doing the maintenance of the machine, who is doing the logistic of the turbo plates, which you can print, he is correct, then it will be in Iceland and it will die in Iceland. Sorry. No. sorry but sorry. Do, you do, do you think we have the ecosystem here in Singapore? Actually, yes. To be honest, you have the education, the educational, the people and the educated people you have. The ecosystem, as I mentioned, we build up since four years and it's a living environmental because, sorry, to answer your no parking space, I believe it. Because in Frankfurt, the government said all banks, only the directors, 21 parking space. Everybody is forced now to use public system. Why? Because you can reuse the streets and build something else on it. And this is the, the topic also of building with manufacturing. Normally, you know, when I come to a manufacturer, he said, this is my building, what can you do? I said, nothing, because normally you reference the product to the production process, and the production process need to be referenced to the building. And at the moment you build first, and now, what can I do with the productivity? I can do the best, but not the optimum, because the design of the building is the last one, not the first one in such a process. And uh, this is, sorry for having a small discussion here and also there. So I think, yes, no parking spaces anymore. I think you have an ecosystem because you have the educated people here, and that's the reason why we in Siemens uh, used to say we, but actually I built up the ecosystem for driving the digital enterprise in Singapore. I cannot do it in other countries. I cannot. Yep. And with it, I pass to you because you were Amos, the great <laughs> any reactions to what these two people have been saying about the ecosystem think, in Singapore? I think Ryman, he, he made all the big enterprises, right? So, so he have a good impression that some of these uh, enterprises, they, they are pretty much ready, you know. Again, I, I speak from the hundreds of companies in Singapore, primarily more from the supporting industries. I think it's important we remember them. 
because after all, they provide a lot of employment, right? You know, and, and I think the reality is, I describe this to, to our company, right? You know, I mean, the digital economy in a way arrived because Singapore already started branding. We are a smart nation, so we provide some online parking, tap here, tap there, right? So I think that's just a small tip of the iceberg, still a long way to go. But I think the digital consumer has arrived because of the smartphone. I think uh, Peter talked about it. You know, I mean, when we talk about a smartphone, it, it becomes an enabler of learning of a lot of things, you know, really right at the fingertips, real time, you know. The, the way I describe it is we have so many workers, whether they come from China, Malaysia, or even veteran in Singapore 30, 40 years, they are already a digital consumer. But when they go back into a factory in Singapore, let's say more supporting industries, uh, not the Siemens and the HPs or the, the, the global foundries, right? Awesome. You know? <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. So, so when, when they are all so digitally savvy, you know, but they go in the factory, they go back 20 years, you see, right? Because none of the work is digitized, right? That's a reality. I mean, uh, Dr. So is there, I know, he agreed with me, right? So I think that's a reality of the manufacturing industry in the supporting area, right? I, I believe we need to help them, we need to transform them. Because these companies provide lots of employment, you know, and of course, this is where the FECs, they are rolling out the ITMs, you know, and, and I think many of us are trying to see, can we help the, the bigger group of SMEs out there. I, I think it's critical so that we do not uh, forget and then we leave them behind. Yes, we want to make sure the majority of Singapore can make it to the advanced manufacturing or the great urban solutions. But you can drag this group of SMEs, the smaller companies along. I think there's a chance whereby they can contribute yeah, yeah. to being part I of it. I agree with you, but are they willing to uh, transform? I think there are some whereby... Maybe as an owner, founder, I, I don't think I need to, right? I'm, I'm getting good business. Why do I need to spend money here, spend money there, and create problem for myself, right? I think there's a camp of people doing that. I think there's, there's another camp whereby I want to do it. I believe it's possible, but how do I start? You see, mm -hmm. I'm trying to make my ends meet. Where I got money to buy another solution here, some hardware there. And when I buy it, I don't even know how to use it, you see. I think that's a reality. So, so I think there is really a group of uh, manufacturing in Singapore. They want to go advance. I think there is a struggle. There is a crossing of the chasm. You know. uh, certainly, Raymond, yeah. a quick reaction. Yeah, uh, a very quick reaction. What is uh, the average size of the orders of Digital Factory? We have around about 25,000 customers buying each year. And what is the average size? 40,000 euro okay. of our order. So we cannot serve, we have only 300 customers ordering more than 500,000 euro. So you can see we actually looking after the mass market. We cannot focus on the big enterprises, very sure. Then something else. There was one company we offered the manufacturing design and then this company invested immediately in the software we have. Mm. But it's very difficult to gain with the software productivity if you don't know how to match your process with the automation level, with the IT level. I'm going to turn this side because we've heard the manufacturers saying they need to have the ecosystem uh, to make it successful. Uh, Hien Fang, um, do you think that the Singapore ecosystem is good enough for what you want to achieve? You mean for, our, our for your business, yes. Well, I think generally in Singapore, um, our companies, particularly in the urban and the infrastructure sector, are really, really small. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and the nature of our business is, is consultancy. So, you know, you win one contract, you don't know when the next contract will come in. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, just like now, we, you know, we're bidding for T5. After T5, there's no more T5, you know, no more terminal. So how do we go? You never so, know T6? Uh, well, you, you need to have the land. Yeah? <laughs> so anyway, just coming back, I think for our sector, uh, just like you know, uh, some of the manufacturers, yeah, you need to have a certain size 
and a certain platform and network in order to invest in the new systems. And one of the things that we are doing is going fully into digital, yeah? uh, building information, modeling, uh, virtual design, construction, and, and so on. Uh, but to do that, you means that you need to invest in the system. You need to be sure that there is a, you know, further order books that you can come with. And I'm afraid for a lot of the smaller uh, firms, it's purely impossible. Yeah. Uh, but this is the way it will be. In future, you will not find uh, you know, any technical consultancy, any architects, engineers that will be doing it on 2D. Yeah. It will be on 3D. Uh, and now we are going even 4D, 5D, 6D. Yeah. Uh, we are linking everything up from design to the FM yeah. uh, and integrating with your, your you know, the, the, the uh, IOTs and so on and so forth. So I believe in Singapore, one of the big problems for the companies in our sector is sizing, networking, and the global platform. Yeah. You will not be able to uh, uh, do what uh, big companies will do. So for us, really is to grow some of the uh, you know, strong local companies into global size. Yeah. And here, you really need to have the sizing. I mean, today, uh, Sabana Jurong started three years ago, uh, 350 million uh, turnover, 3,200 people. By local size, we are quite big. Yeah. But today, we are 1.3 billion uh, uh, turnover and uh, 13,500 people. And if we equate our revenue in terms of the construction volume, last year we would have done something like 39 billion of construction work. And that's much bigger than the entire Singapore construction market. Yeah. So, so you can see that if you don't have the sizing, you know, it would be very hard to push that frontier that you talk about. Yeah. Absolutely uh, impossible. Uh, and the nature also of our work is that you know, in order to recruit the talent, you need to be able to do some of the uh, projects. Yeah. Uh, engineers don't, don't just uh, sit around and wait for you to win contracts. Yeah, I mean, Chuan uh, Singh smile. Uh, they need to be driven by that challenge. Uh, so gradually, you know, we need to be out there to win. So today we are forming an aviation Uh, 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 grouping uh, and, and and look and, and pursuing uh, global aviation projects uh, worldwide and that re you know, allows us to build our talent base yeah. otherwise we would never be able to uh, grow that talent yeah um, you actually bring up a point that I think that is very important our group here to my right to your left uh, uh, was pointing out that the technology is available everywhere, the investments can be made everywhere, but you really need to have the right ecosystem. What you bring there is that it's not only the ecosystem, but it's also the network. You talked about the network, the platform, the connectivity, uh, the, the networking, the positioning of Singapore within a wider network of global operations, let me put it that way. And that's what you seem to uh, suggest that needs to be done. And, and I think uh, globally, we are quite recognized for our ability to be very disciplined in our execution. Yeah, people look at our Singapore branding with uh, high regard. Uh, so this is a sector that I think we can grow quite uh, 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 rapidly. I mean, Peter talked about the getting into the design, you know, the engine. That's exactly what we are doing. Uh, we, we are only going to concentrate on the design and the engineering and not the construction side. And uh, neither is that uh, you know, uh, the manufacturing end. Uh, so mm. we're going to purely looking at the, 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 the technical content of it. Yeah. Rio, you were raving about the advantages of Singapore by saying it's a great place to experiment. It has its special characteristics and uh, it has uh, diversity uh, as, uh, as, as positive points. But are these solutions easily exportable back then to Japan? <coughs> Um, yes. Sorry. You just lean yeah. a bit forward. I, I know by experience that there is here an area where the signals just don't catch up. Um, yes the and no. Um, the core of the technology and the hypothesis of the business model can be proven. 
here. Then, of course, there are a lot of adaptation and customization for other countries, um, Japan and Thailand, Indonesia around. Then, while I'm hearing this ecosystem talk about, um, one thing I'm still trying to find an answer is, creating the ecosystem is um, nice and so funny. Uh, there are many good uh, cases in, in this country, Singapore. Uh, for example, in the uh, sector of manufacturing, um, have you ever visited a center called ARTC, Advanced Remanufacturing Te uh, Technology Center, which is in the um, campus of NTU uh, far, far west, where uh, A-Star uh, took a lead to really create a com community of uh, um, cutting-edge technologies of manufacturing. Rolls-Royce there, IHI there, Siemens there, Wifujitsu uh, there too. So all this ecosystem is nicely, very um, um, designed uh, here in Singapore. But one thing I'm still missing is, then what is the business model? So many people getting together, putting a lot of good ideas. Then many cases, this is not a criticism, but a challenge, our common challenge. Who pays? Who pays? Who are the customer who pays? Who pays for what? So looking around the situation in Singapore, how many real innovation of the business um, happened uh, in these um, uh, years? Maybe not that much. You can count Grab Uber. You can count some um, government-driven um, uh, project. But um, coming back to your question, Arnold, uh, it is a common challenge not only for Singapore, uh, but for other countries, um, especially when you try to uh, export the things um, done here to other countries, always a question is what is the right business for or business model for that. Then, just one disadvantage is Singapore is small market here, so you can't create a business model by scale. So look at Apple, look at Amazon, look at Google; they are really disruptive, but all, all by scale. So I think we have to find, find out a way, maybe Japan too, uh, more um, customer-oriented and end-user-oriented uh, value creation and business model definition. Uh, without going through that, that wall, um, all the innovation sounds like activities would be for nothing in the end. So this is not a criticism, but really the voice to, to me myself even. Peter, uh, you were saying advanced manufacturing is anywhere, any small cities. Uh, Rio is just telling me that it is all about scale. Uh, how do I put these two things together? I've just got to start arguments tonight, right? <laughs> Funny with, um, we started the company 12 years ago with $10,000 paid up. Um, we raised our first round of investment in nine, after nine years, one month, and one day of operation. Why the sad story, I tell you. Um, that taught us to be beggars and mad dogs in a corner. And um, it taught us that we cannot afford to fight, we have to win. Fighting in a business is basically making a business go bankrupt, and the directors and shareholders, if they're liable, and they actually underwrote the loans to also be bankrupt so that you can appear on Facebook and get all your friends sympathizing with you. Um, now, that's a hush, fun version. Um, now, coming to the word scale, I think it's a dangerous thing. When, um, when you fight the word scale, is why do we want to fight that war? When the whole world is fighting the war of scale, um, why should we go head on? Because Time Magazine and Economist Magazine has been using the word scale has been using the word growth as the answer to every business plan in the world. That the way you must do is you must go gig economy, you must go uh, global, you must do la 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 la, when we are not placed for it. Um, I, I, I don't think we should be taking on um, the giants um, where they're strongest. Why don't we concentrate and look at things? Okay, give you a fine example. Um, it's a very complicated relationship, in my simple mind, that after the Second World War, America was not really bombed except for Pearl Harbor. Um, Europe um, 
had to rebuild, what have you not. Well, the manufacturing hub stayed in America, and nowadays, um, you, every single person in this room has got something or a lot of things that are owned, that they own, which are basically American company, right? Apple phones, um, Google, blah, 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 blah. We go through the whole thing. And then we start going from uh, Northern Europe with Germany, Siemens, BMW, um, Airbus, everybody start going down south. You start seeing a very artisan industry. Now, if you look at Europe as a whole landmass in history, why did, why did they not try and do you know, what is obviously wonderful? Um, why, why do they survive up to today when the BMWs, Mercedes, the Volkswagen, Audi group, and, and all have dominated? My point is this, there's a place for everybody. Um, and this, if you want to take on the word scale, which was your question, Prof, um, I think it's, it's tricky. Um, and actually, back to what Mr. Wong said just now, and I said, you know, okay, I have to say, I'm a very proud of the country, we've got fantastic infrastructure, we've got fantastic people, what have you not, but when I said it needs to be complex, um, what Mr. Wong said that Sabana Jerome is doing is I feel exactly that. He leaked something out. He said, you know, um, you're doing 3D, 4D, 5D, 6D, okay, and then you did say that you're taking on Halo projects, right, to entice the people. To me, that is complex. It is not about earning the, first, the next dollar as a business. What he's doing is basically making sure Sabana, Jurong, is positioned at the right point where at the end of the day, with all due respect, sir, there are many developers and, and consultants out there in the world. But what you have is that you're positioning yourself. So I, I feel in the way of scale, will that scale to, will it scale to 20 Terminal 6s? I don't think it would. But I think it would, or Terminal 5s, I think that would give you the springboard to get to the next major, massive international aviation hub, simply because he's, they have approached it in a complex way. They are fighting it not head on, not on the dollar charge. Okay, we can fight. Let me turn to the room. Uh, are there questions from the audience? Yeah, I have a question over there. Very stimulating talk. It's not a question, it's a comment, and then see what I can elicit more comments from the panelists. Uh, very interesting comment, and I like the term, anywhere, any place. There's a lot of truth in that. Uh, not the whole truth, though. And I like the other comment from uh, Rio about between cities and so nations in the future. I think that's going to be quite on the button. Huh? Uh, the reason I say that is because uh, some time ago, our good friend from the U.S. mentioned trade war, right? That scared the shit out of everybody else, except for one little city in the U.S. You all know what happened to Detroit, the automotive city, right? The demise of Detroit because they were fighting the fight, like uh, Peter was saying. And they lost the fight. Columbus did the exact opposite. They were clever, they were savvy, they raised the taxes, they used the PPP to invest their higher taxes in the human capital, in the industrial policy. And now today, they want a the bid to do the smart city, and they just draw in, with 50 uh, million from the federal government, they drew in 10 times of our investment, shortly, 500 million. That, I mean, that's the way to go, and that's what I think the new city in China and different parts of the world should learn from Columbus. Not to do the big scale thing, the big fighting, fight everybody. You choose and you position yourself, and then you create your own value. And I think Singapore has something which I think the panelist doesn't seem to be uh, mentioning, which I think is very important attribute of any city-state that will thrive in the future, leadership. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this was a comment and not a question. Are there questions in the room? Yeah. It's interesting today because we've got educationists, we've got industry. And when we talk about the future, surely one of the important areas is what we're doing in the universities and polytechnics. Why I mentioned this is that years ago I was talking to a German CEO. I said, you've been here in Singapore now for four or five years. What's the difference between Germany and here, the graduates are talking about? He says, well, a graduate in Germany, the first day he joined my company, he hits the road, he's productive. Whereas in Singapore, I need a year to train him before he's productive. Now, in today's context, uh, one year is very costly. We talk about efficiency, etc., etc. So what is the panel's view? 
about what we're doing in education. Is that in line with the future? And if not, how are we going to improve on that? Thank you. Um, I cannot resist to answer that question, but, uh, <laughs> but I will first leave the panel uh, react to it. Uh, Raymond, do you have a comment on the comparison between Germany and Singapore? Uh, you know, out of my own experience, my sons, they study now, and they went to the German section of the European school. The teacher focus on your weakness and drill in your weakness. And my, peop my, my sons were highly frustrated to go to school because they need to overcome the weakness. Then I changed to the English section, IB. They only focus on the strengths. And whatever you do is great. You do it. You do it. <laughs> and my son cannot put a nail into the wall, I tell him. Yeah. So the educational sector in Germany hurts a lot, but the basis, the basis of what we discussed a little bit is not so broad, it's more specific. If we hire people here, and I must admit, um, I only take, give my guys a certain contingent, because I said, if we hire Singaporean graduates, who pumped up in the universities, we are the greatest, the biggest, we will win the world. We educate them for three years, then they find another job with 30% more salary. I said, so please look after, okay, we take youngsters, but look after the people 32 to 36 years. They are married, they have children, they have another responsibility, they stay longer with us. <laughs> Sorry, very, but now what we do is, I can tell you what's happening a little bit, we divide our headcount in feed on the street, common function, commercial, logistic, in COX, cost of goods sold, fabrication, and in corporate. Corporate, we're melting down like hell. Common function, we digitalize our processes. This will then at the end be transactional items, as we call it. This you can do from home. The feed on the street only get 30% desks, and we refurbish our complete office into a Google environmental. So we don't want to have them in the office, but the psychological effect is we want to have a very nice looking office. And when you see the new layout, you don't want to leave the office. <laughs> but it's a different office than you had in Germany, because in Germany it was very structured, you know. Every office, every furniture the same. But you have no structure in the new office environmental, because the guys need to be creative. They need to develop a structure in the chaos. And now I stop, because he has already... No, I just uh, cannot avoid to answer this question. That is that it is the, indeed a very strong preoccupation of us at SMU. And uh, I'm sure it's the same for other universities, but I know SMU better. It is a strong preoccupation to make sure that by the time our students graduate, they're work ready. And that's where we put an enormous emphasis on uh, internships, um, preparing them for a, an environment in which they have to work together in teams, uh, overseas exposure and a number of other things that we invest in precisely because we realize that the academic knowledge is insufficient, that it is actually being able to operate in a uh, work environment that makes them different. Are we always successful? That's for you to judge, but we actually do invest heavily in making them work ready. Is there any other question in the room? Yeah. Listening to Eric Moss, and uh, I really sympathize with him because he sees, I think he sees one part of the industry, the smaller companies, the ones who are having to change and who actually have the most uh, threats to them in our, in, in our manufacturing industry. In the construction side, we have the same uh, issues as well. I spent 10 years, besides working in my own firm and all that, I spent 10 years on the board of the Building and Construction Authority. So we were trying to help. Uh, the industry change. And uh, what we found was that, see, in the 80s and in the 90s, so rather in the 90s and the 2000s, we went through two phases of trying to increase productivity, and we found it very difficult. You know, you can cut manpower, and then when the pressure comes, you have to release it again. 
twice, 90s, 2000s. 2011 was a real crucial year for us. And it's not just us, but it's also in the manufacturing. All the employment passes, all the work permits went down. And it's not going to change. And it actually is for the good for us, because we really need to increase our productivity. Uh, and one of the things we have found in the last seven, eight years has been that uh, it's no good to talk about productivity increase unless we get together as an industry to do changes. You have to have step-by-step -step programs that you can help, not just the big firms, but also the smaller firms do so. Uh, so I'm just wondering, uh, and Hien Fai was mentioning using building information modeling and digitizing. We found that that was actually marvelous because when you go digitizing, BIM is actually just a platform where you can then put a whole lot of other processes on top of it. And today we are now trying to shift construction into manufacturing where we are saying that, okay, instead of building everything on site, which is very messy and therefore inefficient and unproductive, shift it into the manufacturing process where you can actually manufacture it to a certain standard and so on. So we call it design for manufacture and assembly. So perhaps, what do you think uh, amongst the panel that in, for Singapore, because Peter's right, of course, we need to go two steps, but there will be those who need help to go even the half step. So I would like to ask the panel, uh, what do you think we can do to help the mass of people in the manufacturing sector? And we could also learn from it in the construction side. How do you, do you think the present in industry transformation maps, which the different uh, sectors are coming up with, that if the industry and all of us get behind it and do some really calibrated and measured moves with the more powerful and stronger companies bringing the weaker ones along with us, we will have a much better environment for ourselves. Some, qu Some quick answers, uh, given the time constraints. Uh, Amos, do you want to So, so I agree on the point of leadership. You know, I, I think certainly the leadership of the manufacturing industries, whether big or small, has to make the bold move. You know, I think in the leadership, the management to make the transformation themselves, that the workers will not transform. You know, I think the, the difficulties of digital transformation is a lot of mindset, upscaling of workers. So I think that's why I want to re-emphasize again, right? The companies that were making manufacturing is because the leadership recognized the need to transform digitally and go towards more advanced manufacturing. Raymond, any comments on that? Hmm. If you look to construction market, you can print the pieces which are designed and somehow, yeah, not, 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 don't get it wrong, they are somehow similar. If you go to a small, medium enterprise production, everybody has a different problem. And there is not one fits all. That's the reason why at the beginning this Industry 4.0 approach is a very much customized approach for each factory. This is the problem we face. And then, you work in an Asian environmental where everybody asks, show me a reference that I believe that this is working. <laughs> and, and then I, I say, nah, you have a unique problem in your factory and uh, I cannot show you, sorry. Then what we now did, we changed our approach, we call it proof of concept. So what we do is we invest in a small proof of concept to convince the customer it's, it's working and then we can scale it up a little bit here. Peter, any comments on uh, how to bring along the masses? I see two good friends from Enterprise SG there. I think as a, as a country, there is more than enough support. Let's be very blunt here. Uh, but actually, going back, Mr. Lee, what, what I, I feel it is, is um, exactly what Amos mentioned. I think just hunting in packs, I think that that overall momentum that we bring is very important. I think the trade associations across every sector are important because we are what we are surrounded by. If everyone starts opening up and saying that this transformation is working, how wonderful, and we have so many problems, and half my staff wanted to resign, 
because of this problem. You know, that is the transformation that, that the hurdles that he face. This is the reason why we're not getting bonus this year because Big Boss has spent all the money on some digitalization program. But when everyone starts talking about it, everyone says, oh, next year's your turn. Ah. Oh, last year was my turn. And it starts becoming accepted as a norm. Then we have recalibrated our norm, and I think that is necessary. There's nothing more we can do other than just... Sounds very bad. Uh, it's hurt mentality. Now we just have to create the hurt. Uh, any comments, Ian? No? Rio? Um, I wrote down five items, not that that's a summary of uh, the discussion. It's such a rich discussion that it would be impossible to do so. But um, I think that uh, the phrase anywhere, anytime caught on, uh, that is that uh, manufacturing 4.0 is to some extent about customization, smaller lots, can be produced anywhere. And I do agree with Raymond that I still have to see a really performed 3D printing system, um, but they're going to be there at, so, uh, at some time. But um, uh, it is also clear, and that my second point that is that uh, heavy investments in technology can be basically made anywhere. Uh, in other words, uh, to be really competitive, it's about the ecosystem and the ecosystem that we can build, uh, and that was sort of uh, described by, by Hien Fine and uh, Rio. Three, um, Singapore is too small to be working on its own. We need to embed ourselves in a network. That is the sort of the, 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 the framework, the platform, whatever word we're gonna use, uh, but it's about making sure that we are a node in a network, maybe a node that has a very strong impact uh, where we make the money, uh, but it leads to be a node in a larger network. Uh, Rio brought up the point that um, it's all well and good and well to have uh, good uh, investments in technology, a good ecosystem, perhaps a good network, but it also has to have a good business model. And that is probably business model and leadership are two per words that were brought up here, but are uh, quite important. And then finally, um, one thing that I found interesting to uh, ponder about, but, uh, sort of think about what, what it really means, but uh, Peter made that point that um, we probably also need to think about the advantages of being able to tackle complexity. Um, complexity may well be an advantage for Singapore. We have created a complex environment. I think that almost all speakers here were referring to that. Uh, you actually almost said this is the competitive advantage of Singapore, the diversity, the complexity, uh, and that's where we, perhaps we can come up uh, with new solutions. I thought those, those were five worthwhile uh, conclusions or ideas to think about uh, at the end of this uh, uh, debate, and I hope that you will join me in giving a warm round of applause to our panelists. Thank you very much. Such an active uh, and rich discussion, um, unfortunately, has to come to an end. Uh, but I do ask that you remain on uh, stage. And I would like to now um, invite uh, Mr. Lee Swan a president of the EDB Society, to come on stage and offer the panelists a, a token of appreciation. Can we all gather for a group photograph? Uh, thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, you know, and thank you to all those who have helped us help in this event one way or another. Uh, we will be having a fourth forum on 5th of June, and the topic will be aging, wellness, and healthcare. Uh, we do hope to see many of you at that event uh, 
and do look out for it. And to then, take care. Have a good evening.